So, uh, first of all, of course, it's a very, very big honor for me to be here. And, and thank you, Bua and his team, and uh, Nash, for, 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 for uh, having me here and for making this such a wonderful event, uh, for, for making all the arrangements so comfortable. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I also have to say that uh, Boa's work has been inspirational. Uh, uh, certainly his work on epistemologies of the South. And, and uh, it's also not a coincidence that uh, three Indians who have come here uh, are all uh, have or are or have been connected with one center, namely the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. Peter and I are both uh, current members of the center and Shiv was a former member of the center. So <coughs> there is a very special bond between between uh, the, the Sesh, uh, Boa uh, and the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. Uh, and uh, I'm, I very much uh, wish uh, that uh, some other people from the center uh, could have been here, particularly Dubai. Uh, Sheikh, who was a great friend of our, uh, common friend of ours, uh, uh, a friend of uh, uh, ours, uh, and I'm sure all of us, and we both, all of us wish that he was here too. Now, uh, as I looked at the uh, program, it's, it's about uh, thinking about the contemporary, and uh, so I have to begin by saying that we are that we are all in a big mess. The world is in a mess. But I'm going to talk about uh, the mess in, uh, not, not throughout my talk, but I'm going to begin by talking about the mess in my own uh, part of the world, namely India. Uh, we began imagining a secular, democratic, plural polity, uh, grounded uh, on equality, dignity, and social justice. They're all very much a part of our constitution. Uh, but all of that, sometimes it's called the idea of India, all of that is under attack uh, in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years or so. And or perhaps even more. And, uh, and, uh, there are a number of uh, causes, a number of factors uh, which are uh, responsible uh, for, for, this, for this mess. Uh, we can point to the, we can begin with, I mean, I don't know, we can go really uh, back into the, in the, in the, to, to the, to the uh, last quarter of the of the 20th century, but certainly the breakdown of the two empires, the Soviet Empire first and the and the and then the American Empire, uh, globalization, uh, the unimpeded rapaciousness of finance capital, the Great Crash of 2008, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are all factors which are kind of uh, have a more recent origin. But uh, I really want to look at uh, <coughs> uh, what is happening in India, not only in terms of these more, uh, more uh, recent uh, causes, but in terms of something which I think has been going on for at least two and a half to three centuries, if not earlier. Uh, and that is when we began, when, when uh, certain epistemic frameworks which came to India in the 18th century, began to, if not entirely displace, but to damage, distort, subvert the epistemic frameworks that were, that, that were more, uh, I wouldn't say that they originated, because origin is a peculiar term, to all sorts of connected nests that produce uh, Things, but but certainly we were many much more at home in in, in those uh, frameworks. They have been 
slowly displaced. Uh, so that there is a, uh, so the very basic categories within which we we made sense of the world, we imagined the world. Those basic categories were uh, very severely damaged and distorted. And I wrote a paper way back in 2004 about the cultural injustice of colonialism, where one of the uh, categories that I that I referred to was religion, and and it's that which I will I will elaborate that point. The very category of religion is is not part of the of the framework that we in India use. It's a, it's a completely new category uh, that's alien to Indian intellectual traditions. Uh, but since the late 18th, early 19th century, it's taken such a hold on, on the minds of Indian elites and has now become part of part of a larger popular consciousness that it's virtually impossible for Indians to to think without it. And, 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 and they believe they've always had it. Uh, in fact, they claim that India has one of the oldest religions in the world, in the Hinduism, uh, that the, the earliest religions in the world were born in India. That's the claim, right? So you can see how dramatically uh, our way of thinking has changed. <coughs> Uh, from the uh, early 18th century, when people want to know of this category of religion, we now are, have, uh, it's almost become a, a fact of nature. Uh, and things have come to such a stage that uh, dharma, uh, which is the Sanskrit, Pali, Hindi, Dhamma, Hindi dharma, uh, that term which, which uh, referred to local customs and norms, multiple local customs and norms, uh, and later to, at best, uh, the, the, what is morally right, or, or perhaps a law. Uh, now it is uh, a, a, a term that refers, that, that is believed to be the Sanskrit or Hindi equivalent of the word religion. Uh, so in we, we, we sometimes talk about Sarva Dharma Sambhav, which is uh, the, the translation for equal respect for all religions. Uh, so Dharma and religion are seen to be identical, which is uh, completely, uh, complete sort of, uh, to, to use the term of this term, totally, uh, it, 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 epistemically, it's very, very hard to take. Because religion, as we know, is a term that uh, really fully developed in Europe, uh, particularly in the theological discourse that took place in Europe in the 16th or 17th century. And uh, as, as Wilfred Campbell Smith, one of the great sort of uh, historians of comparative religion, uh, he wrote a, a wonderful book way back in 1962, uh, followed by people like Talal Asad and David Lewis, to be a soul uh, uh, who all claim that religion is, after all, a very Christian concept. Uh, so, how is it that a term which was a, a central category and perhaps an invention of, of Christianity became uh, one of the uh, principal uh, concepts by which we in India began to organize our world. Now this is a historical question and I'm not going to answer how that here, how this happened. But but I will pay it some I will draw your, your attention to 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 to, to uh, demonstrate that it has happened, not give you an explanation I'll tell you how it happened and so on, but but that it has happened. And to elaborate this point, I'm going to, I hope I'll do it with some, uh, I mean, I, I, I began thinking about it 10, 15 years ago, but I hope that in what follows, I will do it uh, more subtly with some complexity and nuance and, and a greater degree of responsibility uh, than I have done in the past. And when I say a greater degree of responsibility, I mean that I, I hope that I will not oversimplify this thing, not overstate it, uh, and we do, uh, we give, give it the, the, the right amount of weight uh, 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 the one that it really deserves. Uh, 
And uh, if it is the case that religion was not used in India earlier, uh, but in our times it has become a central factor in economic, then I think we can make a very broad claim such as this, that in the West, by which I mean Western Europe, with modernity, early modernity, you know, later modernity, with modernity, the world, the social world has, on the political world, is secularized. It's a, <coughs> this is a, now become a controversial claim, but I think it's still true for Western Europe. We can say that in India, on the other hand, with modernity, with colonial modernity, India has gone through not a process of secularization, but rather a process of religionization. We are in the midst of that process of religionization. Uh, and, and that's, that's uh, uh, and I'm going to try and show that this is exactly why we are in, I mean, it's not the sole causal factor for the, for the crisis that we are in, but certainly one of the, one of the very, very important causes for, uh, for the mess that, that we are in. Uh, okay, so, in, uh, so let's, uh, I'll, 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 to, to, sh to demonstrate this, I'll draw you into a thought experiment. It's a kind of a brief, uh, very speculative history, a religious philosophical history of humankind. Uh, and I'll, I'll begin with the, with, 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 uh, with uh, uh, by, by saying that, uh, by asking you to assume that at some point in the long, dis long distant past, after humans had begun to live in a linguistically mediated world, they developed a pretty complex idea of the good life, of fulfillment through this, through living this good life. And to develop ideas of self-fulfillment and self-development and so on. And they also began to see a gap existing between their aspiration to, to reach, the, to, to lead such a life and their current state of existence. So the gap uh, was seen and they wanted to overcome this gap. And, 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 and so they had ideas of what we might call retranscendence. So, and I'm, I'm really taking you back, I mean, the, the part, part of this is based on Indian history, but, but it, it, it's, let's say, it's something like uh, 5,000 years or more. So, uh, human beings had life, and they want more of, more, more, a longer life. They had uh, material goods, and they wanted more material goods. They had some territory and they wanted more ter territory, uh, more property. They had cattle and horses and they wanted more cattle, cattle and horses. They wanted some progeny, so they wanted more sons and more daughters, of course. And so, so they had this very simple idea of an ethic of self-fulfillment. Self-fulfillment was to have more and more of these goods. But not only that, they could have, their idea of self-fulfillment could also be less and less of these goods. Right, and so on the one hand there were these hedonists, materialists, but on the other hand there were these, uh, there, there were these world deniers and these ascetics. So uh, also, so let's say that this, this the simple idea of, of the of the phonetic of self fulfillment uh, was one thing they had, but the other uh, thing that they had was uh, that they developed. Uh, some norms of social interaction, interpersonal <laughs> interaction, uh, norms which told them who they should interact with, who they should not interact with, who they should marry and who they should not marry, uh, who they should dine with and who they should not dine with, uh, what each, uh, what job to do and what significance, social significance is ascribed to these jobs, and 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 and, and they had uh, uh, these range of social significances which were all hierarchically arranged. So, so, so these are kind of ordered social relations. And let's, so uh, let me distinguish this ethics of, uh, this ethics of self-fulfillment from norms of everyday social interaction, right? 
So we have these. That's the that's the kind of uh, that's the, the beginning. This is my kind of idea of the state of nature. And now let's say we have the first step. The first step is that we will develop a notion of strong transcendence. They can step back and look beyond. Right? They can you know, imagine a world which is qualitatively different from the one in which they live. They can holistically examine this entire world and see what its limitations are and make evaluative judgments on the whole world. So they now begin to have distinctions of qualitative worth. They know that they desire something, but they also know how to evaluate these desires and to give a different worth to those desires. So, so that's why I call them qualitative distinctions of worth. And so a now a wider gap begins to exist between what they can be are and what at best they can be. Uh, these, these are now radical ideas of, of self-fulfillment, of ethics of self-fulfillment. And they are now in search of a vision that would give them clarity, that would sharpen their questions, and that would ultimately provide answers to, uh, to these questions of how to lead the ultimately good life. So, uh, as they are searching for this vision, they find uh, another human being, a very brilliant, very insightful figure, who is able to give them some answer of, uh, uh, to, to, to these questions. And they get attracted to the teachings of this person. They follow his example, and they, they, this person, this teacher, is not only giving them an idea of, you know, uh, an answer to the question how best your life can be led, but it also prepared to give you a path, uh, uh, the way, Tao, uh, Marga, of self fulfillment. So let's say this is the second major step that is taken by humans. And then the third one, which is uh, that they recognize that there are other people who are following the same path. <coughs> they're following the same teacher. They, there is mutual recognition. Uh, they are recognized as co travelers. And, uh, and this is a very important need because they, uh, to, to self development is not possible without other people doing very similar things, as we know from, from, uh, from uh, any kind of experience of uh, emancipation and liberation. I mean, you really want uh, people to be with you who can give you mutual, uh, from whom you can learn, uh, who can reinforce uh, your ideals, and, and so on. So, so to, to, to the, uh, this path towards self-fulfillment, you are, uh, you need uh, uh, somebody to look up to and somebody who is with you uh, and, and that's the only way that you can dig deeper and look higher uh, which is absolutely crucial to, to radical ideas of self fulfillment and, and because this, the, the, these people have come together there's a formation of something like an ethical community uh, 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 and uh, so on. And that's your third step taking the third step towards the formation of ethical communities. Now, these ethical communities may be gods and goddesses dependent, they may be god dependent, or they may be entirely independent of god, gods, and goddesses, and, 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 and god, right? They may be world affirming, or they may be world denying. But now you have a plurality of ethical communities, these ethical communities do not have very strong boundaries, <coughs> or porous boundaries, there are fuzzy identities, uh, there are serial allegiances, people move from one to the other. And there are multiple allegiances, they have allegiance to one of these communities, but also at the same time allegiance to another community and so on. Now, why, why have I got into all this? Because I think that most human beings, most human cultures, most people in the world have taken these three steps without any difficulty. I mean, this is some of this is being done by everybody. <coughs> and so multiple ethical, religious, philosophical perspectives have developed in societies uh, uh, and which have and these have been inserted 
and embedded in the web of social relations, which I call social social interaction, and they jostled with one another, uh, sometimes in conflict, sometimes they even had violent skirmishes, and sometimes, and very often, they have been complimenting one another, uh, and people have learned and borrowed from each other, and so on. And this is a cultural landscape that has been there in every single part of the world. Uh, and so, a lot of people think that this is religion, but I would argue that, as you can see, that this is, if, if, no matter how you define religion, I don't see any point in talking about this as religion. Right? This is, a, first of all, there's no distinction here between religion and philosophy. These are, there is no necessary dependence on some supernatural or some virtual human God, it can be entirely independent of it. It's all that is required is radical ideas of fulfillment, a path, somebody to look up to, and a, and a whole community uh, doing it. But now, we let's say a fourth step is taken, which is, you might say, the beginning of some story of something. Uh, which we might later call religion. And that is that, uh, to continue with the thought experiment, let's say that uh, this loose community now develops a, a tighter institutional structure. Which institutional structure has hierarchies of status and hierarchies of power? And some of these people in this institutional structure uh, have these, uh, are, uh, 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 are kind of uh, higher in this uh, uh, relations, hierarchical relations, because, because they've taken upon themselves the responsibility of first systematizing these teachings and then giving it a coherence uh, uh, to, and to give the, to these teachings the form of an intellectual doctrine. And now, to be you, it's not possible for you anymore to find, you know, your. To, to go on that path of ethical self-fulfillment without being a member of this tightly structured institutionalized community with, with, with relations of power and hierarchy. So without being without having some 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 relationship uh, to this intellectual doctrine. Uh, and so now the, the multiple ethical communities that you have, which you know everybody that you have. These multiple ethical communities uh, are, are much more strongly demarcated from each other, and, and members of such communities develop a sharper, more robust sense of identity. Now there are some doctrinal conflicts, uh, there is mutual recrimination, and there is a bit short of name calling. You know, people, you know, lots of things happen. So we have taken step four. Now we move further and take this fifth step. And, and uh, we are moving closer to the conception of religion. And that is that some of these communities develop an emphatic conception of truth. And they introduce that conception into the doctrine. Most specifically, they develop the idea of one true God and other gods. After all, these ethical communities are there with gods, no god. So they have one true god of every other community, and the gods of every other community are false. And they erect an insurmountable barrier between, between gods or no god and god. And because these other communities exist, and because these gods and gods and goddesses exist, uh, people are tempted to follow them. And so, there is an explicit injunction that you shall not worship these gods. So worship of these gods is expressly forbidden. Right? So now a belief in one god is accompanied by the idea that those who follow other gods are outside one semantic universe, our system of meanings. And so a new type of radical otherness is born. So where adherence to a doctrine comes necessarily with an enemy to be fought. Of course, these guys who are completely outside can be included 
very clear scrupulosity, but they can do so only by abandoning these other books, by conversion. And if they don't, then they pose an existential threat, they have to be expelled, exterminated, and so on. And of course, people who are within the community can also deviate from this path, they can stray from this path, and they have to be treated in more, even more harshly than, than, than others, they are the enemy within. And so now we have, in this fifth step, you have these uh, multiple ethnic communities which are even more sharply demarcated from each other. They have become very radically exclusionary ideas, a very strong sense of inside and outside, and Conflicts have become a constituent part of these uh, ethical communities. Uh, people's identity are defined in opposition to the other. There is not one among many, but one against many. Uh, 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 only one must remain and others must go. A new form of hatred, a new form of violence, and a new urge to tightly control not just the one's own institutional structure but the whole society. And that brings me to the sixth step, which is absolutely crucial for the formation of religious movement. Step five and six are absolutely crucial. The sixth step is that you'll remember the, there are, there's a distinction between your ethic of self-fulfillment and your norms of social interaction. And the, these two are, are distinct and they may or may not be connected to one another in any meaningful way. They are in most societies loosely connected, but now, because of this desire to control the whole society, the connection between ethics and these norms of social, social interaction become extremely, extremely tight. So tight that they form one system. There is one emphatic system, right? Uh, you cannot have a particular ethic and not follow the rituals which are dictated by the ethic and not follow the rules which are codified in, in a very uh, explicit way. But you cannot have one ethic and not follow the codified the rules of, of, of society which are deeply connected with, with the ethic. So it's, the, the distinction breaks down and there is one system. And I think now we have arrived at religion. This is religion, right? Religion proper. The first three steps are, are not steps to what can be called religion. The other steps, the fourth, fifth, and sixth, formation of, of institutionalized structures, in fact, is the truth. And, and, uh, and uh, the, a tight connection between ethics and social interaction. And that's uh, what I was saying is something that happens. Uh, the seeds of it have been there but, uh, earlier, but, but that is what happens in 16th, 17th century theological history in Europe. This idea of religion as, as, uh, as, as what I've just explained, this is an idea of religion that has gone in the 16th, 17th century. And my point is, that although the first three steps have been taken in India by many, many groups, and even the fourth step has been taken in India by many groups <coughs> in India, till the 16th, 17th century, the fifth and the sixth steps were not taken. And the sixth and the sixth, seventh step, the sixth and the fifth and the sixth step, but began to be taken only at the end of the 18th century, early 19th century. And I'll come to one more step, which is now happening right now, which is that if you have such a desire to control the entire society, you would back your public power, namely state. You would want your state to be behind the system, to be one, you know, to, to be one with the system or to have a very strong alliance with the system. You cannot allow the state to patronize every ethical community. 
You would want you to recognize just one because that's the one who tells the truth, right? That step is now being taken in the 21st century in India, which is why we are in such a mess. Uh, something which was completely alien to us till the late 18th century, the, the first three steps were there, the fourth, the sixth, and seventh were non existent. They rapidly, since the 19th century, these four steps have been taken, and the seventh step is now in our, in the, in, right in front of us. That step has been taken. And uh, that's, that's been uh, a very a painful development. Uh, uh, and and uh, now, there's a water house, I've taken the frame, and <laughs> no eight step, only seven. Uh, eight step I've just taken and I've, I've retreat, retreated. So it's still back on the seven. Now, uh, I said that I don't want to overstate this case and I don't want to, I want to be cautious. This has been said a little too emphatically. But, uh, but and the, in the remaining time, I'm going to challenge this view and, and then uh, meet, try and meet the challenge. So, somebody would say, well, what about exclusionary Vedic Brahmins? <coughs> That's been there for ages. It's been there since the early, you know, in the first millennia before the, before the common era, and it has been pretty exclusionary. So where is all this? Where is that? You haven't really taken that into account. And my claim here, and I, I will be able to substantiate it when I discuss it, if, the, if there's a discussion, because I don't have time now. My claim is, and I, I can show it through some 9th, 10th century Sanskrit texts, show that the mind is now decolonizing. I, <laughs> I can show that uh, while uh, this exclusionary, this ideology or this philosophy or this uh, religious, uh, the, this religious philosophical perspective had its exclusionary view, it was never allowed to, to become dominant. It was always, some way was found to, to, to put it in its place. And uh, just to give you one small uh, 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 kind of uh, example of this, uh, there is a, a wonderful book by Jayanta Bhatta, written in the, the 9th century, he's a Kashmiri uh, philosopher, who has this book called Adam, Adam Adambara, where the whole uh, book is, is really talking about these ideological conflicts and it ends with uh, with with a, with with, with uh, outlining uh, a conception whereby uh, the narrow Vedic view of it's an epistemological epistemology the narrow Vedic view of what is to count as a proper religion religious philosophical worldview and what is not to count the narrow view is rejected and a much larger uh, criterion of of validity is accepted. Uh, which includes practically every uh, religious philosophical perspective, uh, not only the Vedic Brahmin, but also the Buddha and the Jaina. Uh, they're all accepted as, as, and these strategies are very familiar in so called polytheistic cultures. Uh, there are equivalences between gods uh, which, are, which are discovered, uh, there are, uh, gods are hyphenated, uh, they are they're hybridized. And, or at best, there is an ontological hierarchy that is established. So you say that this is one supreme god, and all other gods are, in, are, 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 are sons or daughters or, or slightly uh, kind of uh, uh, lower manifestations of the same. And, uh, and, and, and this entire strategy is, is found not only in this text, but many texts of the 9th century. Uh, and and uh, if you look at a work on, on any uh, non exclusive monotheistic culture, you will find that these are strategies which are quite important. 
And it isn't a surprise, this is not something that happens only in India, it happens in a large, in large parts of Asia, uh, in Japan, in China, there are always ways in which uh, in Sri Lanka, you know, you find that even if Buddha is the supreme teacher, uh, there are all these uh, little gods, uh, Hindu gods, who are constantly uh, either being guardians or, or playing some important subordinate role to the Buddha. So they're all recognized within this hierarchically inclusive framework. Okay, the second challenge would be about, you know, this, uh, people might say, well, there are so many texts which, which have vitriolic naming calling, and, and this challenge has been uh, faced by one particular historian, Nanjit uh, Bhakti, who uh, uh, writes on, on the Bengal Puranas, and, and there you find that uh, 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 none of this really translates into into physical violence, except in a small Pala period uh, when, uh, when this happens. Then there is a third, uh, you know, uh, objection that what about this category of astic and nasty? Uh, isn't that very much like, isn't nasty a term which is very much like the heretic, uh, the affirmers and the deniers, uh, which is what nasty and nasty, not astic and nasty mean. And uh, it, it's very clear from the work of a lot of people that these are, this is a, these are categories which unstable reference. Uh, Jain have their own view of what is Gnostic. Buddhists have their own view of what is Gnostic. Gnost and and so, uh, Vedic Brahmins have their own views of what is Gnostic and Gnostic. And even when, uh, in the 16th century, the six systems of philosophy, which are now seem to be central to what is later called Hinduism, these six systems of philosophy are, are put together and they are Gnostic and Jains and Buddhists are not Gnostic. It's shown by a lot of people that this is a continuum, that these are, this is not a, Gnostic, Gnostic is not a binary, it's a continuum. Uh, and uh, in this continuum, uh, the, 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 the group that is at the at the lowest uh, kind of end of Astic and the group that is at the highest end of Gnostic are more or less indistinguishable. So there is always a way found whereby the one who is supposed to be an outsider is made to come uh, and, and be included in this group. Uh, so, uh, so I can go on like that, but there is People might say, well, why are you blaming your pentalonial modernity? What about Islam? After all, that is an exclusive monotheistic religion. It's not just that the Brahmins shaped their Hinduism in the early, the late 18th century after the Christian missionaries came and they, and they imagined their own religion, or their own religious philosophical framework in terms of, in terms of this idea of uh, religion that was taught by Christian missionaries. What about Islam? And that's also a very valid point. And, and not as much work has been done on it, but I think one can say that when, uh, when there, there were Arab traders who came to India and they did not have any major impact on the, what we might call the moral imaginary of these spiritual philosophical perspectives, which was one of you know, acceptance and give and take and mutual accommodation and so on. But, uh, there were people like Akbar who actually tried to exemplify this. Uh, but in reaction to Akbar, in the late 16th century, early 17th century, funnily, uh, paradoxically, a, a, a Sufi order came to India, the Nakshbandi order, which order reacted very strongly and violently against the, 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 the uh, very uh, syncretic view that was developed by Akbar and uh, laid the foundations in some ways and uh, collaborated with the early Vedic Brahmins to, to lay the foundations of what later can be called religion. And that's the qualification that I want to make into that. And that, so my general point is that it's largely true that the Understanding that the category of religion within which we begin to be, be, be thinking uh, since the late 18th, early 19th century is largely there because of, of the early Christian missionaries who came to India. 
it was accepted by Indian elites and the idea of Hinduism was developed in the 19th century by these great Indian social reformers. They are the ones who constructed it, uh, so they had a major role to play. But the structural, some of the structural preconditions of it were already there. There were some bits of Brahminical Hinduism and the Nakshbandi order. They had already prepared the ground for the formation of religion. But that ground would not have gone, I mean, it would have been completely unutilized and nothing would have happened if it was not for the European Christian missionaries to change their whole way of thinking. Thank you.